So first off, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for IGI Global's webinar, Impacts of Women in the Academy, Confronting Gender Equity, Diversity, Equality, Diversity, and Leadership, featuring the editors and contributors of the IGI Global publication, Critical Reflections and Politics on Advancing Women in the Academy. While everyone gets settled in, I would like to tell you a little bit about IGI Global. IGI Global has been a leading academic publisher for 30 years with an ever-expanding portfolio of 5,300 reference books, over 185 highly indexed journals, and a broad collection of InfraSci databases, IJ Global is committed to providing the highest quality publications, excellent service, and has a steadfast pledge to the research community. We do publish in 11 different subject areas, including major subject areas, including business and management, computer science and information technology, education, and then as we know, this publication is focused in social sciences and humanities. As I discussed earlier before, attendees will have the opportunity to participate in a Q&A session. So before we introduce our speakers, I would like to provide Dr. Um, Sheila from York University the opportunity to discuss our land acknowledgements. Ani Bojo Kwekwe, Samakwe Dishnakaz, Makwa Dodem, Temiagama Anishinaabe. I would like to begin with acknowledging um, that many of us uh, participated in the uh, the development of the book by contributing authors, etc. Um, all come from different parts of the world, and that um, they also rest on traditional territories of many Indigenous people. The editors. Uh, from Laurentian University and York University. I'll just go through their uh, land acknowledgement for now. So Laurentian University is located within the traditional territory of the robinson huron Treaty of 1850 and recognizes its placement on the traditional lands of the Atikmashing Anishinaabek, as well as its proximity to the Wanapate First Nation. <clears throat> As Canada's only university with the tricultural mandate, Laurentian offers an outstanding higher education and research experience in English and French with a comprehensive approach to Indigenous education. Laurentian prepares the next generation of leaders who bring innovative solutions to local and global issues. York University Land Acknowledgement. I want to recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is also subject to the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Miigwech, thank you. All right, thank you very much. And then to start off the presentation, um, Today, we will be starting off with opening remarks from Dr. Robert Hache, who is the President and Chancellor of Laurentian University, and Dr. Rhonda Lenton, President and Vice Chancellor of York University, to speak a few opening remarks on this critical area of research. So, Dr. Robert Hache became Laurentian University's 11th President and, Vice and Chancellor in July 2019, following an appointment by the Board of Governors. Prior to joining Laurentian University, he was the Vice President of the Research and Innovation at York University. And before that, he served as an Associate Vice President of Research at the University of Calgary, as well as the Vice Dean of Research for the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Dr. Hache is bilingual in English and French, and he holds a biochemistry degree from McGill University and a PhD in biochemistry from Queen's University. Overall, he has almost 30 years of experience as an academic, including more than 20 years as an academic leader. So both as a scientist and a leader in research and innovation, he has brought a wealth of experience resulting from a career that has taken him across Canada. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm so pleased to be with you here virtually today for the launch of critical reflections and politics on advancing women in the academy. 
Uh, the book, which features contributions from many notable scholars from Laurentian University and other institutions around the globe, is an important and pressing read. In reading the preface of the book, I was reminded of a story that influenced my journey as a young scientist. It's the story of Barbara McClintock, who earned her PhD from Cornell University in 1927. Today, we recognize McClintock as a great scientist, a Nobel laureate whose work on the development of maize cytogenetics is recognized as pivotal science. Like many brilliant women who came before her and many women who came after her, McClintock struggled to find acceptance of her ideas by her fellow scientists. McClintock's field of research, her sphere of influence, was heavily dominated by men at the time, and they did not have time for her research. It was more than 30 years after her groundbreaking work and only after her discoveries were finally rediscovered by a new generation of prominent male scientists was her work finally recognized in 1983 when she became the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in medicine unshared. For me, her passion and perseverance inspired me as a scientist to not be afraid of asking my questions in ways that differed from conventional wisdom. Further, her career path provided me with some early insight into the additional challenges women peers have faced to achieve full equality in the academic sphere. Likewise, the women who have contributed to this book were spurred on by their lived experiences as Indigenous women, LGBTQ women, and women of color, some of whom have faced career barriers, pay inequity, and even harassment as a result of their gender. You are nothing short of courageous for speaking up and speaking out in this important book. Allies such as myself must also speak up in support of dismantling systems and societal narratives that do not allow us to have equity of opportunity. But as an ally, it's also my responsibility to listen and to make space for the incredible forces of nature who have pulled together this powerful new book. And so with this, I turn the floor back, back over to my esteemed colleagues and look forward to hearing you as you speak of greater details on these issues. Thank you, merci, miigwech. Then to introduce Dr. Rhonda Lenton. Um, she is actually the eighth president and vice chancellor of York University. She joined York University in 2002 as the Dean of Atkinson Faculty of Liberal and Professional Studies and went on to serve as the Vice Provost Academic then the Vice President Academic Provost. A champion of community engagement and innovative partnerships, she has significantly expanded York's institutional collaborations with government, business, community organizers, and other post-secondary educational partners. A sociologist by training, her areas of teaching and research include gender, family conflict, research methods, and higher education. In 2015, Dr. Lenton was named one of the top 100 most powerful women in Canada by the Women's Executive Network, and in 2016 received the Angela Hillard Recognition Award for her Innovative Leadership in Higher Education. And then prior to joining York University, she was the Associate Dean and Professor at McMaster University. So Dr. Lenton, we'd really like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Carolyn. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Bonjour. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation, not only to celebrate the launch of critical reflections and politics on advancing women in the academy, but to also engage with all of the contributors and learn and be part of the discussion. On behalf of York University, I do want to congratulate all of the book's contributors as well as Professor Taima Moiki Pickering and Anna Perra-Guerrero. Also a special congratulations to Sheila Cote Meek, one of the co-editors, and also York University's inaugural Vice President of Equity, People, and Culture. Congratulations, Sheila, as well on the chapter that you contributed. I think the launch of this book is incredibly timely as we really continue to see gender-based disparities in literacy, but also access to education on an international scale. This book also is of personal relevance to me. I come from a large family of mostly girls with three sisters, three daughters, two granddaughters. So I think deeply about the opportunities that they're going to have, as well as the challenges that they may continue to face. 
But my own teaching and research is also in the area of gender. Starting as a colleague in the late 1980s, we were part of a group that were redefining really what the topics were that were considered to be relevant in disciplines. My own research was on violence against women, against children, sexual harassment, but others doing important work on redefining how we think about labor, how we think about the importance of unpaid domestic labor in terms of how economies run. Uh, you know, I'm always impressed by uh, what higher education has been able to afford me in terms of my own opportunities. Neither of my parents got to go to university. And what resonates in the book is the personal experiences of uh, each of the contributors and how transformative higher education can be. New York University is committed to ensuring that we give a broad demographic of students access to a high quality research learning experience. We should be leaving no talent behind. So the contributions that this book makes in terms of the curricular suggestions, in terms of mentorship, uh, the tools that are provided are incredibly timely and I know will benefit a, a number of our faculty members as well. I wanna congratulate each and every one of you for this important work. Thank you so much for having me join today. Merci, miigwech. All right, thank you very much. And I wanted to thank both of you for your remarks and taking time out of your busy schedule and you know working through all these technical technical techn technicalities of this webinar to talk about this um, pertinent topic. So now I would like to introduce you to the main speakers for today's event. These are the editors of the IGI Global Publication, Impacts of Women in the Academy, Confronting Gender, Equality, Diversity, and Leadership, to speak on their inspiration around their publication and how it can be applied to today's context, especially as we're facing the current pandemic. So today we actually have Dr. Taima Moke Pickering, who is a full professor in the School of Indigenous Relations at Laurentian University in Ontario, where she teaches courses on indigenous research, pardon me, indigenous research methodologies, international indigenous issues, and United Nations. She's an author of numerous articles dedicated to promoting the decolonization strategies and social change and indigenous well beings. She has extensive experience working with international indigenous communities, women empowerment, evaluative research, big data analysis, and photo voice methodologies. She received her PhD in psychology from Waikato University. Okay, then next we do have Dr. Sheila Kote Meek, who is the Vice President for your Equity, People, and Culture at York University. She has worked in higher education for over 30 years and has extensive experience leading Indigenous initiatives and experience in, as, as a senior academic faculty of relations. She has led several successful strat strategic initiatives, which are aimed at creating more equitable and inclusive environments for Indigenous people. And then lastly, we do have Dr. Anne Pigagero, who is a full professor in the School of Human Kinetics in the Faculty of Health at Laurentian University and an adjunct professor in Communication Studies at Huntington University. She is also the director of the Institute for Sports Marketing, a research center at Laurentian University. Her PhD studies were focused in higher education leadership and administration. And once again, she's an active researcher who is presented at international conferences and published in various management journals in the areas of digital media, marketing, communication, and sports management. So I'd like to thank you um, for joining us today. And I would like to go ahead and pass this off to Dr. Taima. Kia ora, Ani, warm greetings. Thank you for joining us today as we launch this critical book about the experiences of women in academia. Taking the job as lead editor for this collection was a steep learning curve. I was confronted by the sheer number of academic opportunities lost to racism, sexism, and prejudice. I also began to realize that for me, the journey to this place began long, long ago. I went to school in New Zealand, the Poroporo Native School to be exact. 
At that time, Native schools were charged with assimilating the Indigenous kids into white society and shaping us for manual, agricultural and domestic labour. Despite being the top of my class, no one recommended that I should go to university. Instead, I was told I could make a good secretary or do some type of domestic job. My intellectual intuition told me I could go much, much further than the boundaries of that racist and sexist bubble. And for that, I'll be forever grateful. During my academic career, I had to put up with stereotypes that women were too emotional, not scientific enough, not smart enough, or too outspoken. As a Māori, I was asked on a number of occasions, did you get a special scholarship to be here? Like many, I worked long, long hours to prove that I was fit to be an academic. In more recent times, the Me Too, Women's Marches, Time's Up and MMIW movements gave me the motivation to do something more for women's rights. I found myself using social media as a site for activism. Big data analysis on women's issues became crucial. I wrote more on the importance of women. I had found my girl power voice and I decided to assert it. All of which has led me here to this 12 chapter collection of women's narratives of which I am extremely proud. The truths in this book are compelling. To quote Maya Angelou, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Woman of thorough. It would be difficult to dispute that we're making this all up. These stories like mine are our truth and therefore our source of inspiration. In this time of COVID-19 global upheaval, Universities are facing financial challenges. There is a danger. Decisions may be made without a gendered lens. So investments in gender equality are critical at this time. Let this book lay solid tracks for all women who join the Academy. Kia ora, miigwech. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. And then we will go ahead and then move on to Dr. Sheila Kote Meek. Good morning. You really aren't university material and shouldn't think about going to university, said one of my high school teachers. Me, feeling like I wanted to slide down on my desk and disappear. And you, you shouldn't even be here at this meeting. You have nothing to contribute said by a senior professor to me at a meeting with colleagues. I was pre-tenure, me feeling like an imposter. A group of people talking at an important meeting, you raise your hand to question, ignored. You interject and ask the question again, ignored. Me feeling invisible. These are but a small sample of personal experiences. If they were one-offs, one could likely shrug, shrug them off as being benign. However, these messages are often perpetuated within the system more often than I care to know and hear. I have heard numerous stories shared with me about women's experiences in the academy. The messages we have been told as women are not only challenging to navigate, but they also can have very lasting effects. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality, which points to the different ways that race, class, gender, and other identities intersect with one another. 
The intersecting layers of multiple identities further impact how people are viewed and treated in the academy. For example, women who are Indigenous, racialized, live with a disability, or who may be LGBTQ2S, experience the world differently. It is important to understand those differences. For example, an Indigenous woman's experience is very different than that of a woman who may be living with a disability. While this book, book does highlight a number of barriers and challenges to set a context for women's struggles in academia, what I really found amazing as I read through the various chapters is the sheer strength, courage, and resilience of women. And for that, I have to commend each and every contributor to this collection. Sometimes I even have to pinch myself because I wonder how I've managed to be here. In my experience as an Indigenous woman, it isn't even about breaking that glass ceiling. It's about what Sarah Mid in 2012 describes as banging your head against a brick wall. That's how difficult it is to break down the norms of institutions. In order to disrupt ongoing sexism, it is critical that we expose it. This is not always an easy task. Writing back to, my, to systems, in my opinion, while needed, also takes a tremendous amount of courage. It is at this intersection that we begin the process of opening up systems in order to bring about change. This is really what motivated me to contribute to this book and become an editor. It has also motivated me to do the work that I do at York University as the inaugural VP of Equity, People and Culture. I have a deep passion to mobilize systemic change. So I'm going to leave you with a few strategies for change. There has to be an acknowledgement that, that oppression and discrimination exist, and this book does that. There has, we have to develop strategies to resist further sexism and racism and other isms by supporting one another, and this book does that. It's important also to surround yourself with people who care and are willing to do the hard work of change, and this book promotes that. When given an opportunity to write and amplify women's voices, take it, use your experiences, and use your privilege to uplift other women, including the next generation, and this book does that. And last but not least, amplify women from diverse backgrounds. And this is what this book has done. I've, I'm very honored to be here today to celebrate the launch of this important book. And I want to thank each of the contributors for sharing their experiences and putting trust in us as editors. Miigwech, merci, thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. And then we will go ahead and move on to Dr. Pigarero. Hi, so I think in the announcement, in the introduction, um, you found out I was a full professor in the School of Human Kinetics at Laurentian University. And I wanna say that my journey to get to this position hasn't um, been smooth, as probably many of you have experienced yourselves and a lot of the people have shared in the book as well. Uh, I had to move departments because of bullying and harassment in my institution. And this came about when I started to achieve some success in my research. And I think this success brought recognition to me, and that seemed to threaten my former colleagues. But I started to talk to people about these experiences, and I started to realize that my experience wasn't unique, but that many of the stories around these experiences weren't being shared. And so we all experienced them individually in a silo without a lot of support. So when Taima and Sheila came up with the idea for this edited book, I joined in really with the hope that the book and everyone sharing their stories could help the next generation of women who want to come into higher education. I grew up in what people would call a traditional family. Um, we would be what, if you grew up in North America, would be Beaver Cleaver. Um, my dad worked, my mom stayed home. My dad was always really supportive of education. Neither he or my mom had a chance to have uh, education past high school, so they wanted me to do more education. When I graduated with my MBA degree, my mom really thought that I should jump at the chance to be someone's administrative assistant and really not aspire to be more. And at first I was very angry with her setting these sort of limitations for me. And then I had to realize that that's what she was told she could achieve when she was growing up. And she didn't know any different. And she thought that would be the same for me. 
So I'm still not sure that today she understands what I do for a living uh, as a professor, but she's always super supportive, which is great. For me growing up, I loved playing sports and I wanted to play every one that I could. Every sport that was out there, I wanted to try it. So when I went to grade school, I uh, remember watching, we have research, recesses here in North America, we all get outside and play. And I remember watching um, boys in, at my school play ball hockey and I wanted to play. So I went up to the male teacher who organized the ball hockey and I said, could I play? And he said, no. He said, hockey was for boys only and I should go and play with the girls who were playing tetherball or something else in the corner. And I've never forgot this because to me, this was the first memory I have of being told that I couldn't do something simply because of my gender, because I was a girl. I mean, I was told like everyone else, right? When you're growing up as a young girl, be polite, be quiet, because everyone loves a polite little girl, polite little girl. But no one simply told me you can't because of my gender. So I think this experience has probably led me to pursue things that maybe have been less traditional for women. When I think about this book, my hopes are that the, all the amazing contributions from the strong and brilliant women that we have in this book will have an impact for women in academy both today, but also future generations. But it's also for me a really good chance to work with uh, Sheila and Taima, two strong, brilliant women who've been through the tough roads in academia, and they've shared some of that today, but both now who are leaders and working with them was a huge bonus for me. I hope that others, people on this webinar, people watching it, people reading the book, will draw strength from the stories and the knowledge that were shared in these books, this book, sorry, and hopefully in turn, they'll use it both for themselves, but also to support other women. We're living in a real interesting time right now with COVID-19, and I think I naively want to look forward to a world, you know, where women no longer have to battle or have negative experiences. And as we think about what the world is going to be like, I think I'm going to challenge us to say we can't just return to the normal it was. We must return to a better and that hopefully we can all work together to make this a better new normal. Thank you. And then we also um, did have some of our contributing authors here with us as well to talk about their chapters. Some of them have been pre-recorded as they're obviously all over the world and really to give an international scope to this overall research and the publication. So to start off with, we have Prof. Elizabeth Damera from Mammoth College in the United States. She will be discussing chapter six, the emergence, experiences, and empowerment of women administrators, coaches, and athletes. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Damera, and I'm one of the co-authors of chapter six. Dr. Lindsay Darwin and I worked on this chapter together and we feel it's extremely important to understand the history and evolution of intercollegiate athletics so that you can gain a better understanding of why there's a current lack of female representation in sport and then to explore and dive deeper into some of the systemic issues within intercollegiate athletics. Throughout the chapter we discuss the evolution of intercollegiate athletics starting as a student-run, male-only based organization into the multi-billion dollar industry that it is today. We touch on the impact that Title IX had on institutions across the country and how it created more opportunities for women in sport, both as student athletes, coaches, and administrators. And then we talk about the merging of men's and women's athletic departments into one unified department and how we saw a sharp decrease in the number of opportunities for women at the administrative level, the coaching level, and as athletic trainers. In 1983 when this merge happened, roughly 90% of women's teams were coached by women and today in 2020 about 40% of women's teams are led by women. So a huge decrease and we think it's important to understand and dive deeper into some of these systemic issues so that moving forward we start to build up that female representation in sport and we keep women involved in sport. Um, when you're looking at that lack of representation and you look into some of the underlying issues you commonly see a lack of respect for women in sport. I think anyone who's on social media, um, you go to a professional women's team and 
you read some of the Twitter trolls and you know there's a million reasons why men think that women's sports you know aren't valid because they're slow, they're boring, women will never be as fast as men, all of those things you hear on a daily basis um, within sport and I think for a lot of women it can be very off-putting and that lack of respect doesn't make them want to stay in sport. Um, you know, there's a double standard for men's coaches and women's coaches. You know, if a men's coach gets a technical foul, you know, he's labeled as passionate and, you know, if a women's coach does the same thing, you know, she's not cast as kindly as passionate. She's moody, she's emotional, she's unstable. And I think that double standard can be extremely frustrating. And then I think extremely important, there's just a lack of female role models in sport. To quote Carol Hutchins of University of Michigan softball head coach, you can't be what you can't see. I think for a lot of young women, you can't imagine yourself as, you know, working in athletics because you don't see people working in athletics. So we dive into all of this much more in depth in our chapter and then Lindsay and I have actually spent a bit of time talking about how the coronavirus pandemic has kind of exacerbated some of these issues that we see. Um, I think for everyone in athletics and higher ed in general, the coronavirus has changed a lot and I think it will continue to change a lot. My personal experience with it as a current head coach, um, I coach women's lacrosse at Monmouth College. We were really just getting games going in our season. We had played three games and, you know, things were just getting started for us when the NCAA shut down spring championships and then institutions began canceling seasons altogether. And, you know, it's going to be really interesting moving forward to see what happens on a broader sense. There have been a lot of institutions who are cutting programs, both men's and women's and there are even some institutions shutting doors because they can't afford to stay open. So I think athletics are going to be severely impacted by this. It's going to be, you know, huge to see what happens in the fall come football season. I know for a lot of institutions, um, football is a huge revenue generating sport that helps fund non-revenue generating sports, largely women's teams, so it's going to definitely have an impact on sports moving forward and I think, you know, only time will tell what happens, but for now I think it's important for women in athletics to continue supporting one another and continue to be those positive role models for our student athletes and, you know, anyone who might want to work in athletics in the future. Next, we have Prof. Bronwyn Carlson from McGuire University in Australia. She is now going to be discussing her chapter, Chapter 7, Indigenous Killjoys Negotiating the Labyrinth of Dis Slash Mistrust. My name is Bronwyn Carlson, and I'm a professor and I'm the head of Department of Indigenous Studies at Macquarie University in New South Wales, Australia. I'm an Aboriginal woman and I was born on and live on Dharawal country in Wollongong, south of Sydney. Like many Indigenous people here in Australia, my journey to and through academia has been fraught with low expectations and limited opportunities. Like many, I was the first in my family to attend university. I came to university as a mature age student after a career in Aboriginal community controlled health. I've always been really inquisitive about the world and I wanted to know why some people had more opportunities than others. And I wanted to know why some people in Australia refused to see Indigenous humanity. And I wanted to know why we were continually told we were not worthy. So my chapter is about my journey into higher education. And it begins by recalling the advice from one of my teachers who told me I should become a cleaner. There were no opportunities to dream when I was at school, and I was never really asked that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think it was because it was already decided by society at large that an Aboriginal student wouldn't have aspirations. Although some could argue that I've successfully navigated the system now that I'm a professor and head of department, 
But any successes that I have had are not because the institutions have afforded them, as you'll read in my chapter. It was because of my pers persistence and the tenacity that I inherited from a long line of strong Indigenous women. Any gains I have made in terms of qualifications or employment have also been made possible because of the Indigenous women who came before me who literally kicked down the doors to these institutions to allow a space for Indigenous people to come and study and to now become professors in academia. The collection of stories is important and it's really important for those who come after us. It will show them how we navigated the system and importantly, it will show them that it's possible to do so. It will, I hope, draw attention from those in the decision-making positions in our institutions who will be able to gain a better understanding of the journey we must navigate and the issues that continue to make it difficult for us. The book is important because other Indigenous women who will read this will know that they are worth being in higher education and they will know that like those who came before me, that I'm here and I believe in them. COVID-19 has really changed the world significantly in recent times. Our communities have, have been and continue to be significantly impacted and it will take a long time for us to recover. Women will no doubt be at the forefront of imagining life after the COVID-19 crisis is over. Indigenous women are generally at the forefront of community and political activism in our communities. We will no doubt find a way forward to build our communities and to heal from the devastation. History tells us we have survived and that we can do it again. Pandemics are not new to Indigenous people. We've survived them before and we'll survive them again. Next, we have Prof. Ann Timmons from Memorial University of Newfoundland, Canada. She will be discussing Chapter 10, I Didn't Expect You to Be University President, a critical reflection on three decades of women leadership in Canadian academia. Hello. My name is Vian Timmons and I'm President and Vice Chancellor of Memorial University. The name of my chapter is, I didn't expect you to be a university president. This chapter is an outline of my professional and personal journey as a woman. It includes some unsettling experiences. My story is not unique and I'm telling it so that other women may feel comfortable telling their stories and then maybe that it will make a difference. When I was a child, my grandmother told me how much she loved school, but she only went to grade four. I asked her why she went to grade four and didn't continue, and she said it's because she was pulled out of school and became a housekeeper. I said, if you loved school, why didn't you stay? She said she couldn't because she was a girl. That was the first time I realized there was gender inequality. My mother also had a very challenging time. She wanted so badly to be a teacher, but when she graduated from high school, she was unable to go to teacher's college. She got accepted, but she couldn't afford it, and my grandparents couldn't help her. She and my father ensured that all six of us kids went to university and got an education because they could not. It's been an interesting time as a woman in the academy I've seen progress in gender equality, but not nearly enough. I was the first female university president in the province of Saskatchewan, and now I'm the first female university president in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. I look forward to the day when there are no more firsts, when there are sixths and sevenths. You know, people still think that the university president should be a male. I was talking to some grade four students one day. They told me that I didn't look like a university president. So I asked them, what does a university president look like? They said, tall, gray hair, glasses, and male. This was just this year. We have a long way to go to close the gender gap. And until it changes for all women, it changes for none. We need to ensure the conversation continues and the academy should be leading the way. We need to mentor female administrators. We need to work together to promote and encourage and celebrate accomplishments. Do you know, as women leaders, we need to change the course for future generations of women. While not just lifting women up, but sometimes even holding them up. 
It is important now more than ever to have women in leadership roles given the impact of COVID-19. This is not an equal opportunity pandemic. More women are on the front lines than men. Women have been seriously affected by this pandemic. We need a feminist approach to recovery that women in leadership can support and provide. Look at the seven chief medical officers in Health in Canada. They are inspiring a whole new generation of women leaders. We have a lot to do and we can do that together. Thank you. Now we have Profs. Joelle Dickinson and Carla A. John from Laurentian University and Cambrian College in Canada, respectively. They'll be discussing their chapter, Chapter 12, An Intersectional Love Story, When Gender, Culture, and Sexuality Meet. Hi, I'm Joelle, or the white one. When we were first asked to write this chapter, I wasn't sure that we could contribute that much to this perspective of women in the academy together, because we don't work together and we have very different roles in our respective institutions. However, once I realized that our everyday lives have actually influenced how I navigate the academy, it became much easier. Our chapter turned out to be a combination of how our daily lives as a lesbian couple illustrate intersectionality and how clear it is that as women, we don't have homogeneous obstacles or experiences. Our book chapter was originally called something like Intersectionality in the Academy. Um, and then one of the, re the reviewers of our chapter called it a love story. And when we went back and reread the chapter, it took a very different perspective after that. Hi, my name is Carla. Um, when I was asked to write this chapter, I didn't consider that I had anything valuable to add. But upon reflection of my experiences, a lot uh, sort of came up in terms of my observations over the years and watching how people justify their actions that to me are clearly influenced by my race, my sexuality, my disability, or my country of origin. So being able to maintain, um, being able to be an observer of this behavior instead of just reacting to it has really benefited me in my work where one of my main jobs is to influence the culture and diversity of my institution. Uh, one of the examples I didn't give in the chapter, but I'm gonna give now, is that we used to do training together uh, for equity and inclusion. And at the end of our training sessions, I would we would say that we were in a relationship and people were always shocked that we were in a relationship because they thought of me as the black person and that was my only, uh, the only category that they would put me in. So it's just interesting. How you can't be black and lesbian. You're the black one. Right. I'm the lesbian. Right. The white lesbian. Um, one of the uh, examples that I can go over is, and it happens still to this day, and almost every time that we go grocery shopping, the cashier treats Carla like she's stealing my groceries. <laughs> So we go through and Carla will be chatting on the way through. Um, and then Carla goes around, I pay, always, always pay. <laughs> uh, books. And Carla goes to pack the groceries and the cashiers have literally tried to stop her from taking my groceries. Don't take this poor white lady's groceries. Um, so now we purposefully adapt. I'll say as, as Carla's about to pack her groceries, I say, um, don't smush the bread again. Or something like that. I never smushed the bread, by the way. Just you smush the bread. I don't smush the bread. Anyway, I hope that you enjoy our chapter and thank you very much for allowing us to contribute. So now we would like to go ahead and move on to take time to conduct the QA portion of our presentation. Um, for you who have any questions regarding this critical research, feel free to use the chat box at the bottom of your GoToWebinar control panel to ask questions specifically to our lead editors. Okay, so it looks like we have um, a few questions then for our editors. So one question is, throughout your publication, um, it focuses on women in the academy. However, there are universal themes that are discussed. How do you think the research found within your publication could be util 
utilized across other industries or fields? Sure, I'll start. Uh, I think that uh, the experiences in the academy are not uh, in a silo by themselves. I think that uh, we have some uniqueness in universities, but the work structure uh, exists in many organizations around the world. So I think these experiences and the stories are would not be different if we were that much different if we were asking women to share them from, you know, the tech industry, from human resources perspectives, from marketing companies, from other industries around the world. So for me, I think that they are transferable and that other industries could certainly learn from them. Okay. So then the next question we have. So this goes a little bit more on the overall publication um, and your research. So from the beginning of your research to the end of the pu publication process, how did you see your project transform and take shape? What surprised you the most about the research that you were able to compile from your contributing authors? I think um, the, the work, uh, when we initially started, um, we had reached out to a number uh, of uh, women that we knew of in the academy, um, knew, of, knew of their work, um, and uh, we invited them to submit chapters. So we also did uh, a call, but um, our, what I think when we were reading through the chapters, what struck me the most was um, how, how there were so many similarities in some of the narratives that were shared with us, but at the same time, because of the intersections of race, class, gender, uh, et cetera, the stories were, were unique. Uh, to uh, individual women and individual scholars, but certainly uh, women uh, just generally in the academy, uh, it just documents the experiences that they have and the challenges that they have uh, in the academy. But like I said in my earlier comments, I think what struck me the most was uh, how strong and resilient women are as well. So despite the challenges and despite uh, the barriers that they experience, um, they still persisted um, and still persist and look for sources of strengths, not only within themselves, but within others. Um, and I think one of the things for me, what this book has done is I've uh, created another new community uh, of women uh, scholars who are committed to supporting one another as well as uplifting one another and working to make systemic changes uh, in the system. Okay, thank you very much. And it looks like the next one is actually um, more of a question. So we have, I have known talented and digital diligent pardon me, PhD candidates and junior faculty who have been told to put their personal lives on hold, particularly in terms of childbearing, um, to the point where one was told that she could potentially jeopardize her chances of being awarded um, tenure. Um, she continues to explain that she's known single mothers who in no certain terms, um, you know, are trying to balance pretty much their child's needs on top of their professional needs. Um, what provisions currently are in place to help women really balance their family and work life and support them with flexibility so they can just go ahead with quote unquote life and not just the academy? Very good points. Very good. Um, and definitely in the COVID context that we're in, we're finding ourselves working more from home using more technology some of us might even be changing our pedagogies a little bit more some of us might be also searching uh, for support from our deans uh, from our uh, peers uh, to keep ourselves sane as we're working from home and um, our, our typical normal support team is not always around us and then prior to covid we've been talking a lot about what's happening to women in academia in general. So now we have women in academia plus COVID. And, um, our, and even through the book, there are many examples of resilience and ways of reaching out. And so I'm going to extend that to you. Reach out, talk to friends, um, go for walks if you can and it's safe. Um, use, use technology not as a barrier, but as a connector. Um, I connected with my home in New Zealand. Um, I have family across Australia and New Zealand, and we had set up regular Zoom meetings. 
and we talked and my mum, my beautiful mum, is a priest and she would share prayers with us as well. She would share her culture. And so there are many different ways that we can utilize and I would encourage you to use whatever is important and relevant to you uh, to uh, seek that source of inspiration to keep you going. We need you. We need your research. We need your ideas. We are 50% or actually over 50% of the population. And we must see ourselves reflected in academia. And so if you can, stick with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And a great follow up question actually to that question, especially while we're talking about um, COVID-19 and the obvious pandemic that's been affecting everyone internationally. Um, you know, many universities and other higher education institutions are seeing layoffs, furloughs, salary cuts, pretty much altering, I think we can all agree, the entire educational system. Um, in what ways do you expect COVID-19 will have a lasting impact on women in the academy, you know, in the future? What lasting impacts do you think the pandemic will have? Okay, I'll start. Um, I think... I think this is a generational thing. I think this is, as we see, it's a it's once in a hundred years. This is going to be like tracking the impact that we saw from a, a demographic like the baby boomers and how they changed society. But this is also going to have the same kind of impact, probably in a more negative way. Um, I think the long term impact for women in the academy is not going to be great. To be honest, we 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 need to address that right almost immediately. We're already seeing early research showing that women are are right now at home with, with increased responsibilities in their home with children, uh, with caregiver roles, such that you know research that's being submitted is being submitted by men at this point, and women's productivity has decreased, and not because they don't want to, because they, they just are always taking a larger share of what happens inside their homes uh, for work. So I think that that has a long lasting impact, but we as leaders and organizations and institutions have the ability to, to fix this before it becomes a problem in terms of looking at tenure clocks, in terms of looking at promotion and, and requirements and changing them to deal with what the, the impact has been. Um, I think that's that's my hope that they'll do that. Uh, the structures are difficult to change, but I do think this is gonna have a lasting impact and we'll watch this sort of a demographic shift in, in, in terms of the impact probably transfer over the next couple of decades and see it happen. I might just also add uh, to Anne's uh, comments around, you know, looking at some of the institutional practices around changing uh, and providing, um, you know, extra time to get tenure, um, you know, uh, looking at ways that uh, we can support uh, delayed sabbatical requests and so forth, and that those are also looked at uh, from a gendered lens or a gendered context. Um, also. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate uh, that I work at a university where uh, women are very well represented, uh, mostly across the whole academy, uh, including senior leadership. So th that, this is a great place for me uh, to feel very comfortable uh, as a woman. But um, I think, too, when women uh, academics make requests, they should you know, for accommodation, um, et cetera, they should be really looked at um, carefully as well, because we want to be able to support uh, women in academia, especially junior scholars who uh, are pre-tenure and who may feel particularly uh, vulnerable. Thank you very much. So then it looks like we might have time just for um, one or two more questions. Okay, um, a question that we got was, what are the measures that need to be adopted for motivating women um, in academia to reestablish their identities post COVID-19? So kind of going off of our previous question, talking about how COVID is really transforming, um, you know, the academy, and then really looking at, you know, once we get past this, what do we have to do in the future? Um, if you read the chapters, you will notice that depending on our age, uh, our voices were small at the very beginning of our careers because we were protecting our career. Um, and then as our voices got stronger, you you could have a correlation between when we became associate professor to full professor to tenure track. 
Um, and that's what we did to survive then. Um, when we got bigger research grants, we were able to express more of our research ideas, um, you know, really entertain and push the margins of our methodologies uh, so that they reflect either our culture or relevance to being a woman. Um, and I just want to say, don't do that. Because I think we were part of not helping us out. I would like that you use your voice right now, right the second. Tell me who you are, where are you from? What do you believe in? Who do you need to reach out to? And one of the things that's permeated throughout this book is these amazing ways that women change that voice to make it proud and loud and amazing and brilliant. And for many of us, especially us three, we use social media as our activism tool. And that's how we got more connected with people, with women, not just in our own society, not just only in our own units, but right across the world. We found women were talking the same story as we were, and that gives you a lot more guts, if you like, or more confidence to say, I was right in the first place. I am meeting somebody who looks and talks like me. So if you can branch out beyond your discipline, and I was raised in psychology at Waikato University, and I've reached right out. Um, you know, today I can't honestly describe what I do. I do things that I love. And that's what you should be doing in your career. Do something that you love and that you're proud of, and you can make a difference. That's what I would suggest you do. COVID now, post-COVID. Okay. And then it looks like we may have time for one or two more questions. So one question that someone has is, you know, um, what is men's role specifically in, um, you know, in the lens of women in the academy, looking at obviously being allied with women, and then also, you know, in your opinion, do men face um, the same challenges or how can they understand the challenges that women are facing? So okay, first, today, I don't think they face the same challenges. <laughs> let's just let's just be honest about that. That's why we need a book like this. That's why we need a women's network. I mean, if you look around the institutions that everybody's in, just take a look. Who is who is uh, the full professors? Who are the department chairs? Who are uh, the leaders that you see? And uh, there there's still a lot of males and predominantly white males. So I think that we need to acknowledge that. As Sheila said at the beginning, we need to acknowledge there is a problem, This that, that this you know sexism, misogyny exactly exists, that it's actually in our structures. And, and we would need, hopefully, male allies to start recognizing that. That would be my first comment. Sheila probably has more to offer. <laughs> yes, I, I totally uh, agree. And, and I think the, the role of our male colleagues is, is to provide um, spaces, I guess, um, and create spaces for women to participate and be a part of uh, academia, whether it's uh, a professor uh, in a particular a discipline or whether uh, they look around at the senior administration um, and, you know, recognize that uh, women are often uh, underrepresented uh, in in various areas of the academy, but I also think it's important um, that when uh, our our male colleagues are looking around, uh, they also look at the intersectionality aspects of uh, which women, uh, if they are represented in the academy, which women are there. And uh, typically, uh, being a senior administrator myself and being uh, Indigenous, there are far and few between Indigenous um, academics who have made their way into uh, senior leadership. And so there is an underrepresentation, oftentimes, uh, of women, women of color um, and racialized faculty, uh, women with disabilities and so forth, um, that are represented in various aspects of the academy, including senior administration. So uh, I, I would encourage our male colleagues to uh, look around and look at ways that they can support women. Um, and look at ways that they can bring uh, women into their departments and create those kinds of environments where women uh, not only feel welcome, but they're supported um, 
vis-a-vis -vis all the other roles that they often hold in society that Anne pointed out earlier around uh, caregiving, et cetera. But maybe I'll just say one last thing. All of us white women who are on this, you know, we we experience some of the things because of our gender too, but we also have privilege. And so when we do advance, which alternatively we know we would advance um, faster than, than women of color do in the academy, our job isn't to, you know, just climb up a ladder. Our job is to get to that top and throw a net down and bring more people with us, more women, women from the different, um, you know, different uh, categories and, and use that privilege to, to pave the way. I think I've seen too many times where we see, well, oh, look, we've got one woman into administration and that woman doesn't do her job, which is throwing down the net and bringing the community with her. So we need we need male allies, but we also need women who, who uh, achieve some success to be allies and open the doors and throw the nets down and bring more with you. Okay, thank you very much. And then that will end um, our Q&A portion of this presentation. But at the very end, we will have all of the Enders contact information, obviously, um, looking at bringing really this discussion and like I said, building that community um, of women and we can continue this discussion through email, and then also on social media. So to end the Q&A portion of the um, presentation, I'd like to um, pass it off to Dr. Moreke Pickering for a few words and closing remarks. Thank you. Before we go, I would like to end this webinar with the poem that I wrote that sits right at the front of this work. Dear all women and girl goddesses, keep all women safe in your embrace. Let our collective tears cleanse our guilt, shame, and despair. Embrace all our sisters as beautiful and inspirational beings. Remind us to search for the lessons that, we, that have come into our pathway. Give us collective strength when we are weakened. Stand with us when we rebuild our lives over and over again. Give our thanks to all women and girls that stood strong in the face of adversity. Send our love and solidarity to every generation of girls and women that came before us. When we are down, shine a light so we can see the path ahead. Encourage our collective to embrace joy and fun. Support us to open our minds, our bodies, spirit and vision to all we can become and more. Keep instilling us a positive framework for living, working, playing, resting and being. Surround us with warm, loving, kind and strong women and girls. Help us to be open to boundless energy and gifts. Learning from a woman and girl's perspective is our paradise. Thank you from the Women and Girl Goddesses in Training. Kia ora, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. And just to let everyone know, to learn more about this research and the publication that was featured today in the webinar, be sure to visit um, actually IJ Global's website. As we've noted throughout the presentation, this publication is really geared towards um, allies, academics, researchers, deans and provosts, and even those within the leadership of education, including you know, policy makers, looking at chancellors and administrators as well, um, as it features a wide range of variety of topics, including STEM education, mentorship, women in leadership, equality, intersectionality, intersectionality legislature, and politics. So just to let everyone know today, for everyone who's listening, we're actually offering a 50% discount on this publication when you utilize the coupon code IGI50 during step two of IGI Global's online bookstore um, checkout. So obviously really wanting to make this publication widely available to everyone who would benefit. Additionally, to ensure that you're able to continue this discussion, and obviously we want to encourage the continuation of this research, you are able to use this coupon code on all of IGI Global publications. And we do have many publications covering similar topics, including some of our best-selling titles on women in higher education, the Me Too movement, and women in leadership. All of our titles, including the 
title we feature today is available in print and electronic format, as well as featured in IGI Global's Emphasize Books database, a database containing IGI Global's full collection of eBooks. Um, for more information about this title, any of our titles, be sure to visit our website and also recommend them to your institution's libra librarians to ensure that these publications are made available to your wider um, university community. If you're interested in learning more about publishing with IGI Global, whether that's in the scope of this particular research or across any of our 11 different subject areas, you can visit our website at www.igiglobal.com backslash publish. And then, as I said previously, if you want to continue this discussion outside of obviously this presentation, you're welcome to contact any of the main editors of this publication to continue this conversation either through email or then also social media. If you have any questions regarding purchasing or the title specifically, you can contact me directly. Um, I'm Caroline Campbell, and I'm the marketing manager at IGI Global at marketing at IGIglobal.com. And then for any questions regarding um, anything that Laurentian University had to say today to our editors or media inquiries, you can go to Sean, Mr. Sean Malley from Laurentian University. So once again, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today, and we look forward to continuing this important conversation.